Old Gold Club. Powered by Wolverhampton Building Supplies. With Mikey Burrows and Chris Iwalumo. Welcome along to the Old Gold Club. I'm Mikey Burrows. Alongside me, as ever, is Mr. Chris Awellamo. And our guest this week spent four years at Molyneux between 1993 and 1997. Welcome to the Old Gold Club, Jeff Thomas. Thank you. Um, normally, I kind of put like um, the appearances in there and goals and stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, but obviously, your four years was really heavily affected by injury, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was blighted by injury. Um, started so well as well. We we played down there at Bristol City, won, and the, our performance was really good. And we went up to Sunderland, the old Roker Park, and scored probably one of my best goals in my career, right near the end of the game, to make it 2-0. Celebrated a little bit, maybe a little bit over the top, <laughs> and that's why somebody took uh, exception to that, and it did me, really. You know, uh, it was a tackle that... Um, was meant to do harm, and it, that was it. I had to take it. That was me out for a couple of years. It was obviously a great start. Four goals, eight games. You come to a new club. That's that's the start that you want. How how does that affect you mentally? You know, because I, I think there's a lot. We've touched on it a few times already, like depression. Because for me, I was I I, I was injured four months here, and that's probably the longest that I've been away from football. Mm. Luckily enough, and that is that's that's quite harsh to say. Four months. Yeah. When you're talking years. How how do you, how does the body the the, the mentality cope with that? Because you seem like a strong person anyway, but it must be hard. Yeah, no, it was tough, um, and because it started so well, and the, the season before, uh, I I had a chance of going to go into Blackburn Ro Rovers, you know, and they their story was very similar to this. It was a family that were taking it off and uh, taking it over and wanted to, to get it into the top flight, and obviously Blackburn went on to do great things. And then the opportunity of coming here happened the year after. And it was like similar sort of messages coming out from the Haywood family. And I thought, I just wanted to be a part of this part of this dream. And uh, like you say, it started off so well. <clears throat> Not just the goals, but the f performances. I felt I was back on top of my game mentally. I was, I was strong again and enjoying football better than anywhere else. And <clears throat> to have that taken away was was really, really tough. But then it's just a case of <clears throat> thinking, right, I need an operation, <clears throat> excuse me, and then how quickly can I get back? And after about seven months, <clears throat> it came clear that it was, wasn't was done yeah. right. And so um, it, another year passed and it was just so, so tough. And there, there was a physio here that we called Mad Dog and he was, uh, he just, I don't know, he probably hates me, but I used to be a pain. But uh, there was quite a few injuries, sadly, yeah. in that period as well. There was, because you were a major signing at the time. Because it was what, I mean, you mentioned there was interest from Blackburn, who obviously three years later go on to win the Premier League. Um, there was reported interest at the time, I don't know how true this was, that Arsenal and Man City mm. had also been interested I spoke in to, around the time. I, I spoke to Peter <laughs> Reid um, the night before I signed for Wolves. And this is where I'm a Man City fan. And everybody thought I was going there. All my family thought I was going, and I did, to be honest. But Graham Turner just kept on calling me, saying, we've got these great plans. Want you, we've got Steve Bull, who deserves to be in the top flight. We just think you're a big piece of getting us there. And I just, it was just one of them things. And with the Man City talks, I also had talks with Trevor Francis at Sheffield Wednesday. And it was in that changed my mind. He said Man City was the best club I ever played for, but don't go there now because it's going to implode. And he was right. And uh, he was explaining why it's going to implode. And I just weighed everything up. I, I felt I want to be a part of a club that's probably going to start going down or do I want yeah. to be part of a club that's... Uh, and what I like and, um, you know, like these people like Ian Wright, who was a kid when I was playing at Palace wanted to play at the top level and win things I just wanted to be a, always a part of something that I was proud of and hopefully things would follow that but um, <coughs> I just thought just coming to Wolves was really fulfil a lot of things and you, so you'd put that down to Turner then a lot of that just his persistence coming for you talking to you telling you the plan of the club you know, I think in some situations it is important as a player. You look at the club, a Man City fan, there's interest, you spoke to the manager, but then there's something 
that just kind of takes you takes your eye off that ball and think you know what this is probably better for me at the minute what 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 was it about Turner that that, that kind of infatuated you with with the club then would you say <clears throat> it was just very very honest a nice guy and uh, I just warmed to him straight away and I actually drove up here and we had a meal and we had a, a, a bottle of wine shared a bottle of wine and we was talking about his plans and he started telling me about his family and just got to know him in such a short space of time and and then <laughs> the, the thing that got me was he rang me just before he was going on a family holiday and he says listen I don't want it to be ruined I want to know that you're going to sign and I, I said look just let me think about it. And then he just kept on ringing me from a holiday. And so it was one of those things, just, uh, yeah. Because at the time, me down. Um, David Kelly, Kevin Keane, Cyril Regis, Peter Shirtliff, yep. all came in in that summer. It was kind of the real start of the stadium was pretty much nearly done. <clears throat> yep. And you spoke to us on our podcast a bit about, you know, you suddenly see that for the first time there's, the rebirth of a football club almost that it's yeah. it's there and suddenly Sir Jack's throwing money at it because even in the summer of 94 suddenly there's million pound being spent on Don and <coughs> John DeWolf comes yeah. in and Steve Frogger and Tony Daly and the, um, Neil Emblem came in yeah. at that time mm -hmm. like that was serious spending for the time it was and I think it, everybody thought that the club was going to get to the top but not just get to the top but carry on Doing what the Blackburn ended up doing, you know, we, we, I thought it was I was part of something special, and with the players that we're bringing in, you know, um, there were some quality players. <coughs> Kevin King from West Ham was, you know, a yep. top top winger, and um, you know, David Kelly had done everything at that level, you know, and never done at the top. You know, he always seemed to be Championship level and but scored lots of goals, and he was proving that again here. And uh, you had Don Goodman to that, and various characters it was a, a really good strong squad but sadly it was decimated by injury did that did that make it harder for you you know like obviously you're you're, you're part of the group you're you're probably not you yourself frustrated because you you know that you can't really get get that to that level that you want to be because mm -hmm. of injury holding you back and then you see the likes of these quality players you're thinking you know i want to be part of it i want to be able to be a hundred well as close to a hundred percent as you can because a lot of players you they never play a hundred percent but you know what I mean? Like you said yourself, when you first came, you've scored day goals, you've had a great start. You weren't quite, you were on, on the best form that you, that you felt you could be in your mm -hmm. career. Yeah. And all of a sudden it's taken away from you. But all of a sudden, this club, it's it's true to its promise. They're bringing in these players. They're, they've got that 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 drive, that that mentality, that player, the players coming in. That must be even harder for you not to be, I'm, I'm, I'm at my best. Yeah, I did. and it was a case of what if. You know, my yeah. career is what if. <laughs> my four years here it's, and even when I was watching the games going by and it was what if you know there's certain games where I felt I probably could have influenced of course. it you know with my style we brought in people like Darren Ferguson you know and uh, mm. Simon Osborne great midfielders but you know uh, the physical side they, they were lacking and I just felt you know, the balance was probably not right certain times and that's when you start looking at a game and you, you get frustrated oh, I wish I was playing I could have made a difference today but um no, it's just, it's, it, sometimes you've just got to step back and say, right, I'm injured. You can't get too frustrated. <clears throat> you just got to work hard in training. So it, Tony Daly had a serious injury at the same time. And me and Tony probably got the skinniest legs in football anyway. And we ended up being like, I don't know, we were massive, our chests, our arms and everything. We just used to do pump weights. And it was yeah. a, just a one way of getting us through this dark period of, of just challenging ourselves to make us, who's going to be the strongest today. So and then challenge all the fit guys to come in, come on, see how many weights you can do. And they used to get bored with us, but uh, it was a way of keeping ourselves entertained and motivated. Because uh, I was looking through the numbers uh, the other day, Sam, um, you started the first four league games of the 94-95 season, at which point Graham Taylor had obviously arrived. Um, you then missed the next nine, returned to play seven in a row through November, then you only featured another three t times as the team lost in the playoff semis that year. It's that kind of stop-start nature, I guess. That if you, if it, is it different if you are long-term injured, like you missed 
the whole of the 93, 94 season mm-hmm. after that injury. Whereas at this point, you're now kind of coming back for a bit, getting a little run, feel like you're up to speed, and then you're out again. I think because you're out so long, you, you get little niggles that pop up that would never happen before. And I think because the injury, like you say, first time you get your head around it, you're going to, you know, you're <coughs> going to be out for six to 12 months. And but then to be told the operation was wrong, so you have to have a bone graft to fill the holes in where the, the tendons have been put in there with the screws and everything. You had to wait, I had to wait eight weeks not doing anything. My knee was just no, nothing keeping it together for, for that length of time. And then go back into the operation uh, to have it fixed again. Thankfully, it felt better straight away. So mentally, that got me through that period. But then Everybody knows that getting back after such a long time, it's you, the rest of your body needs to catch up with the, you know, you do, you try and do as much strength work everywhere to, to keep it balanced. But yeah, it's frustrating. And, and bizarrely, when we got to the um, semi final against Crystal Palace in the playoffs, I felt I was not far off back to my best. And this is 97 by this point. Yeah, and it's just, it, and, but it was too late. You know, we, sadly we lost uh, the first game, but we, we battled out the second game, but um, just fell short. But that, that was my, my Wolves career over. And it's, it's bizarre because it, it is a what if yep. um, <coughs> period of my, my career, really, because it could have been probably the, my best period. But it became my most frustrating period at uh, such a great club. Can I ask, was there much dialogue between like yourself and Turner and yourself and Taylor in, in that, at that period? You know, they're old school managers and managers probably then, if you're, in, if you're injured, they're not really... Or, or, or was that dialogue quite good, their man management quite good in that kind of sense? Because that's important for a player to yeah, be injured as well. Yeah, Graham Turner was great. You know, he's, obviously I was um, really gutted for him really because he, there was a, a couple of <coughs> players getting injured who hopefully were going to make a big impact on the, on yeah. the club and and sadly is I think we played Swindon away in a cup game and the crowd started turning against him and I don't think he lasted too much longer so then Graham T- Taylor comes in and Graham Taylor I've not spoke to since uh, my French chip against well my whatever I don't know what you want to call it against uh, we'll get to uh, that don't yeah. you worry so it's England against France and that happened and Graham turns up and I've not spoke to him since 91, 2, whatever it was when that happened and it was an interesting first meeting with Graham Taylor but he's, he's such a nice guy Graham as well and we, we ended he up was, he's going to ask you what, come on then well, no, because I'm fascinated <laughs> by it because uh, you know he, um, he gave you your England cap nine caps nine, nine England <coughs> caps never lost so, but you hadn't spoken to him no. in that period. No, and I, would, I was I was on standby. I played one more game uh, in Russia, but I got dropped to the B side, and I, I was in everybody's squad. You know, in the in the papers, I was in everybody's squad to go to Sweden, and then I got told I was on standby for the squad going out there. I was expecting a phone call off Graham or something to. Just say something, but then I just and that was a tough period. That was the season after. It was a, it's a tough game back, knowing that uh, you've you've not been a part. It was in in a way it was good that I wasn't a part of what happened in Sweden. But um, that's Euro ninety two. Yeah, and but um, yeah, it was a tough. It, that was a tough time. But then Graham has a way about him, and he he always had a coach with him, uh, Steve Harrison. Steve Harrison was fantastic as as he's, he's, he's number two. He just sort of had everything that Graham didn't have, and they worked so well together. And it it ended up being a, a, a bit of a joke, really, you know, with with what went on. It was it was it wasn't it was like I say, it was an interesting first meeting. But after that, it, it was sorted. Did you get answers then to why you <coughs> were on standby? Did you um, ask the question? Yeah, <clears throat> and I, I asked the question why he, he didn't get in touch. He said, well, you know what football's like. You know, you just have to concentrate what's in, in front of you and what you have, and sadly you weren't a part of it. Um, but I'm very, and he, he did say, I'm very proud that I give you nine caps and you played a part in, because I think he went about 13, 14 games at the start of his England career, if not, not losing a game, you know, and I was a, a part of that. So 
And I, I think he was uh, sledged quite a bit with bringing certain players in that weren't the norm, which weren't like the Arsenal, Man United, Liverpool yeah. players, the top four. He was he was a, probably the first manager that started looking beyond that to, to make England a decent side. Because we talked a, a little bit about this with Tony Daly when he was in right back at uh, one of the very early podcasts that we did, because he knew, obviously, Graham, before he went to England. Yeah. And then, obviously, <coughs> then me. signs for him and knows yeah. what he's like afterwards. You obviously knew him during the England period. And then afterwards, how different was he by the experience that he'd gone through? <clears throat> and, uh, it's hard to say because he, when you met him, he was very strong and as if like it didn't affect him. But I actually nearly moved next door to him. There was a, 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 a housing development being in uh, some coalfield, that area. And it was, I was looking to move into this brand new house and then Graham turned up with this house next door saying I'm buying this I just thought no this is going to be a little bit weird but <laughs> you know. well, we, we got close because we were talking about are, are you going to move in or you're not we put, both put deposits down and it, it became more of a friend Graham he became somebody I could ring up and and especially with later on after finishing football with things that went yeah. on after that you know he, he became a great help Um. Because uh, eventually, by the time you kind of get back in, and as you, you say, when you felt like you were finally back, mm. and we're talking kind of 96, 97 period now, Graham had gone as well. Yeah. And suddenly it's another manager that you've got to try and develop Mark with in Mark McGee. Yeah. Yeah, Mark was, I, I don't think <laughs> we hit it off right. You know, I think I was probably at the most frustrating part of my career. You know, where you, you feel you're getting back fit and you're not getting the chances so you become a pain in the backside really you're so always on the training pitch <laughs> probably not involved with the first team squad for a little while and i was kicking balls all over the place i remember one just kick having a competition with myself seeing how high i could kick it in the background and he's, he's probably thinking that idiot over there but <laughs> I, I was just you know i was frustrated and we we probably didn't we'd get off on the right foot and then <clears throat> A few things happened with <laughs> my career with Mark, which after your you, your career is finished and you look back, and I've met him a number of times since, and we you know get on well, and it's I recognise he was under pressure, I was under pressure trying to get fit. That it was just uh, one of them things. We is didn't really it, is get that, it off. Is that a regret then? Maybe that you you never done the right thing at that moment in time for the situation. That if you done it, if you done it properly, maybe. Yeah, I think I think it's a, a bit both. I think okay. um, there were certain times where it was obvious certain things were were going on, and it was more political and okay. and what should have been happening. But you know, it, it does football. You know, you'd, and I found myself probably for the first time not being able to get force myself into a side um, because other people were in front of me, which is you know you, you respect. But um, no, I, I just I always remember a game at QPR where uh, we had, I think, Simon Osborne and Fergie playing midfield and they were getting ripped apart. <clears> and <throat> we just had a bit of a set to our half time because uh, Don was involved in that discussion. And then I backed Don up, Don Goodman, and I backed him up. And it just became a bit of a free for all. And eventually he changed uh, the, uh, the formation. He's just, to be honest, it's probably looking back. It's probably all the pros probably thought they had the right to say things. And in, back in the day, we did. We it, that was the way the dressing room. I think it was on the change where managers probably wanted players just to go there, shut up. Is that, that that's a negative? Doesn't that's what's wrong about football today, isn't it? Well, I think, I think so. Do you think that it's, it's about having leaders that can that can make a comment? That's the managers brought you in. He, he brings in players to trust. We had the chat with, with Mick. He brought players in that he knew that he could trust. They were an extension of him See? out on the pitch. But they, they, you're not going to agree all the time. But no, it, you're open for discussion, aren't you? Exactly right. And I think that's where we sort of um, didn't sort of connect. And I think I had probably, looking back, did I have too much to say? I don't know. I don't know. Because you were a former captain, though, weren't you? Yeah. And you I, were a senior pro at this I, point. At this time, I was a senior pro. And I just I felt certain things had to be said. And... Obviously, you know, looking back, was I right? I don't know if I was right or wrong, really. But it was that was the way a dressing room was, and that's the way I was brought up. You know, 
a manager would let players have a go at each other for about 10 minutes and then he'd have his bit. And then we'd go out second half or full time, we'd get on the coach and think about it. But yeah, it's just, um, it was a period where it was frustrating for me. I just felt like the, the club was just on the cusp, but just, you know, I just wanted to be a part of something that was was, was good, really. Because kind of how bittersweet was it for you in the end that your kind of final act as a Wolves player was losing in the playoff semi-finals to Palace? <laughs> to be honest, I, it's, I, I've cried twice on a football pitch. Once when we lost uh, Crystal Palace against Man United FA Cup final, 1990, and that I just, I just, I wanted to win that much. That I knew my career had finished at one, <clears throat> and I, I just felt I just wanted to finish on a high, and I just, even if it was getting to Wembley, we lost there. But I know it was my old club, but I'm, I've, I've never been one of them that doesn't celebrate. Yeah, you know, if you go back to your old club, I, I, I just give myself hundred yeah. percent to that club that I was signed for. So, kissing your badge and all that sort of thing, I, I didn't believe it. I just, you just give hundred percent for your club that you play for. So, I got a stick. I actually scored on my first game back at Crystal Palace when I think Wolves we won two one, and I got the winner from a corner and I celebrated. And Palace fans still pull me up about it, but no, just because uh, that, like, it almost it, to me, it says a lot about your character and what you were like as a as a man as well as a player. In that, you know that you're going to leave, and I presume, given the relationship you had with Mark McGee, even if Wolves had got promoted, you probably thought, "I'm not <clears> going to be around." Yeah. And so you go into a game against a club that. You, I mean, I know you were crew and stuff beforehand, but effectively, you know, you, you captained them, you were in FA Cup finals and everything, a club that clearly would mean a lot to you, and yet your primary thing is, I want to get this team promoted that I'm in, even though I'm not going to get any of the benefit from that. No, um, <clears throat> it's pride, isn't it? It's, it's, it's more than that, though. I, keep, I don't, To be honest, I didn't think about it. I knew that this is probably my last game if we lost. I even played left back. I was put left back because I, I don't know if somebody was an injury or um, Palace were causing trouble in the first game. But um, I played a, a ball through. I can't remember it like it's yesterday. I played a ball through to Mark Atkins to score the first goal, and it was like it was one of them balls I remember that he cut the the defence, and I was about, oh, that was alright. <laughs> 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 and it's just things like that you remember and I just think you know I was thought this is it the, the crowd are, some people have actually said it was the best atmosphere they've ever had at Molyneux at the time and I just felt I got I got caught up in all the emotion of the game and everything and we just ran out of steam hmm. just ran out of steam um, we talk about emotion um, obviously you went through something that I think the majority of us will never ever truly um really understand how hard it is and what happened to you after your career finished with the diagnosis of leukemia and just to kind of finish off our, our facebook show from this because it kind of i don't know whether you felt it, it brought you back and brought a lot of feelings back when it happened to carl in the last oh. year or so yeah <clears throat> it's, it, i was doing the tour de france as a fundraiser and um <clears throat> i was having a bad day i just had a crash and it was, I don't, can't remember, we were on probably about stage 10, and it's a gruelling event. Even if you're doing it the way we were doing it, we're just trying to cover every single mile every day, just one day ahead of the professional. And I was having a really tough day, and I was, and you know where you see these um, programs where they get loads of celebrities, or not, you know, like a Big Brother situation? Yeah. When you get caught up in a team doing an event like this, you become part of a bubble. And what's what's going on in your world, falling off a bike and your team trying to get you to the end of the, the day, is all that's in your mind. And then all of a sudden I got off the bike feeling like, crap, really. And then somebody said, have you heard news about Kalakimi back home? And I don't even know the guy. And it just, poof, again, it just like a punch in the face. And I just, I was an emotional wreck. You know, I just, it just brought everything back. Mm. Why I'm doing this? Because I was questioning, why am I doing this again? Stupid idiot, you know, getting on a bike. But I'd just done an interview on ITV 
um, live to while they were covering the tour on ITV4. And it just all the emotion just came about why we're doing it and for people like Carl, people who had just been diagnosed and all that. So it was just, and it brought back my first day of being diagnosed as well. So it's, I knew exactly where he was and what he was feeling and just, that was it, just. Because do you have a different perspective on your football career because of what you went through in, in, pretty much football. immediately after you stopped playing? Yeah, not not just football, everything. It's, I had a, probably about nearly a year of non-football anyway because when I got injured here, I invested into clothes shops. So I went in to chuck myself into business for a year then thinking I'll get that consolidated and go back into football. But then I got hit by diagnosis. You know, saying that somebody's saying that you've got only three months to live. It's pretty, uh, it makes you stand still and it hits you hard. But, um, but what it does, it makes you put everything in the right boxes. You know, you, you, you come back to thinking about just your family, what they're going to do after you've gone and making sure that everything's in place for them. Yeah. Nothing else matters. And then somebody, some, some great professor, doctor comes up to you and said, you've got three years. Wow. Just three years to me was like the best news ever. So looking back, what it did to me was put, make everything. Uh, I just enjoyed everything anyway. But it put football in a different box. It, it put everything into a different perspective, really. And when you came through that, you made that decision that you were going to do as much as you could to help other people. Because you have raised, I mean, you're not going to say it, so I'm going to say it right now on the Facebook show so it goes out. You've raised millions of pounds, haven't you? Well, we've, uh, we've put something in process that's helped that happen, yeah, definitely. We've, um, my professor who saved my life, he's, he was seen as a maverick um, because he wanted to change things. And... He didn't have a voice. So doctors, he's, he's cruel, really, because these doctors and and professors and nurses, you know, they they it's like a football team. They're given a, a, a team, and they have to do the best with that team. But when you find out you could have Lionel Messi or you could have Ronaldo in your team, but there's, uh, the structure's not allowing that to happen, then you find you can play a part in changing it. So I became his voice for a couple of years. There was a me and a fellow patient that became, uh, you know, we campaigned, we went down to Parliament, we, we were in front of all sorts of different health ministers, uh, health secretaries, the NHS we were in front of. And I found myself in a, in a world that it was far removed from the world of football, but the way you approach things, very similar. You know, you've got a team and you, you, you believe that um, a, a few tweaks here and a few tweaks there can unlock something special. And I think that's what we did. We, we, we knew that the science was there, and that could probably save people's lives. <clears throat> but the ability to get that science out wasn't there. And it was just an infrastructure of clinical research nurses that we started yeah. funding and putting them in different hospitals around the country. And then you put an umbrella over them, and then you collect all the data from the patients that are, are suffering this illness and then you find pharmaceutical companies were giving us free drugs and that's leveraged about 250 million pound worth of free drugs into the NHS and what we're finding is people having new hope so rather than the olden days where people are saying sorry we can't do any more there's, there's a likelihood now that there'll be a trial that's going on that potentially could be life saving cures now because um, there will be a lot of people because you're a patron of cure leukemia yeah, I should say, which obviously, um, uh, I don't want to use the term benefited. It sounds like such a, a weird term to say it, but obviously from a lot of the donations <coughs> and fundraising that went on during that last season for Carl. And I think um, there will be a lot of people who will just hope that that can make some kind of a difference. Uh, well, I can say for a fact it, it, it has done. And it's, it's cure leukemia is, is, is really Charlie Craddock. He was a professor. He set it up because he felt he, felt he was shackled. Um, just to give you one example, there was a girl that um, he, he had to tell that she didn't have long left. But there was a trial 
and the, the only way she could get that trial was an investment of so much. So we made some money in. It just allowed her to have a little bit more time. And, but she shouldn't have got to that point. She should have had the, the latest treatment. But he knew about that latest treatment, but he just couldn't get hold of it. So it's just, it's just knowing that he's had to go through that probably more or less every day that you know, he's telling people like this. Yeah. So you, 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 you feel like you, you've got a big role to play. So what Kill Leukemia have done has been a proving round of how things um, should be done but then had to sell their their knowledge to other big organisations, you know, trying to get it into Cancer Research UK and Bloodwise and all these bigger bigger charities. But now what what's happened over the last five years or so, uh, Cure Leukemia have, have just been driven for patients' benefits, not the business or anything like that, it's just purely pa- patient benefits. And like you say, sadly, Cure Leukemia put us on a, a, a different even just getting into Wolverhampton, more people knowing about the work they do. And and that's been my role really, is is patients have a voice. Yeah. And and they have a bigger voice than some of these special people, these yeah. scientists and doctors. So, you know, you, you just, you become a part of that world. And if you can, like Carl Akeem has done, he's, he's made it clear that you know he wants to help out in the future and he's he's finding his way how he's going to do that but even going through that you know he was he was fantastic the way he's he's, he's attacked it and um and the wolves supported him and like you say the charity benefited i hate the word charity you know it's it's something that i don't like um saying i'm a part of but it's we like to see ourselves as a business and our business is actually finding new ways to benefit patients. And we believe we're on the cusp of something really, really special. Well, it's really powerful um, what you've done. And we're going to talk a little bit more about your fundraising efforts on our podcast extra as well. And then we're going to completely twist it around and talk about your miss against France, yep, right. which we have teased people <laughs> with. That will be on our podcast extra, which will be available to download from all the usual places as well. Don't forget, you can always get in contact with us, oldgoldclub at wolves.co.uk. Uh, say, download that podcast. It'll be well worth it. Thank you very much for watching. The Old Gold Club, powered by Wolverhampton Building Supplies, with Mikey Burrows and Chris Iwaluma.